Okay, so uh, finally here, we have our headliner coming up. And again, I will uh, encourage all of you, if you're interested in any of the uh, poets' work, they are, most of them, selling them. So go ahead and talk to them, or, uh, yeah, go ahead and talk to them after the show. Um, all right, I know we have uh, on, your, on your table a bio for Michael Salinger, but I just want to read one chunk here. Michael has been writing and performing poetry and fiction for over 20 years. And this time, he has become a fixture in the performance poetry at education community performing and teaching in over 140 cities and in 26 countries. His work has appeared in dozens of literary journals published across the United States and Canada, including in Poetry Magazine, Sapphire Magazine, Tap Root, the Detroit Metro Times, and the Cleveland Free Times. Without any further introduction, our headliner, Michael Salinger.
and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for the light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of this poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Let's see how they're doing here, okay. Um, if you want to make money as a poet, write for kids. I'll tell you that right now. This book is a book of SAT vocabulary words, of humorous definition poems. I've got seven books of poetry out by various um, university presses and small presses and literary presses. This book has outsold all of them many times over. So I'm going to do a couple of uh, definition poems for you. And this whole thing started with uh, my partner, Sarah Hover, who had written some definition poems for um, younger kids, and I wanted to write some for some older kids, and we both say that this started with Emily, with um, Hope is a Thing with Feathers, and it's, it's, gone, it's gone from that. So, um, novice. This poem is defining novice. Novice hasn't quite figured things out yet, you see. He's just been sent into the game, doesn't have much experience, but he's more than willing to try. Just the same is not his fault. Everybody has to start somewhere at some time, and I'm sure he's going to get the hang of things. I'm just saying I am glad, Shelley, that he is your surgeon, not mine. <laughs> Poem by 
by another poet. This is by a man named um, Mark Smith. And I heard him do this poem 20 years ago, and I know that it wasn't a direct uh, inspiration for the one I wrote for my son, but it, it had to be in there somewhere. When you get to the top of the mountain, pull the next one up, and there'll be two of you. Roped together at the waist, tired and proud, knowing the mountain, knowing the human force it took to bring both of you there. And when the second one has finished taking in the view, satisfied by the heat and perspiration under the wall, let her pull the next one up. Man or woman, climber of mountains, pull the next hand over the last jagged rock to become three. Two showing what they've already seen, and one knowing now the well-being with being finished with one mountain, with being able to look out a long way toward other mountains, feeling a temptation to claim victory as if mountains were human toys to own. When you ask how high is this mountain with a compulsion to know, when you stand in relationship to other peaks, look down from where you have come up and see the rope that's tied to your waist, to the next man's waist, to the next woman's waist, tied to the first man's waist, to the first woman's waist, and pull the rope. Never mind the flags you see flapping on conquered pinnacles. Don't waste time scratching inscriptions into the monolith. You are the stone itself. And each man, each woman up the mountain, each breath exhaled at the peak, each glad I made it, here's my hand, each heartbeat wrapped around the hot skin of the sun bright sky, each noise panted or cracked with laughter, each embrace, each cloud that holds everyone in momentary doubt. All these are inscriptions of a human force that can conquer, conquering hand over hand, pulling the rope, next man up, next woman up, sharing a place, sharing a vision, room enough for all on the mountaintop peaks, force enough for all to hold all the hanging bodies dangling in the deep recesses of the mountain's belly, steady, until they have the courage, until they know the courage, until they understand that the only courage there is, is to pull the next man up, pull the next woman up, pull the neck up, up.
10 minutes to three, his arms soaring forward as if outstretched wings, the birds nested in the center of the walking flock are of little concern to the leather weather skinned duck man. It is the outliers that he eyes from beneath his straw known lie. Those few who would rather snap at those muslin scraps than attend to the task at hand, just as one is gently tapped in on the right, another attempts to escape from the left, dreaming of pastures not within the constrictions of today's curriculum. And every good tender of livestock knows one never plays favorites. Although, how can he help but admire those who push at the edges, the ones who make him work the hardest. Um, Sarah and I do a lot of work together, and we've been we've been a couple now for like I guess 13, 14 years or something going on here. Now. Whatever that equals. We don't do math, we're poets. Um, <laughs> And one thing we discovered when we got together is we both had written poems about insomnia, um, years apart from each other, but we both compared insomnia to a train. And that was just kind of, so when we, we generally do these as a, as a one for two voices, I'm going to yank mine out by itself and I'm going to read you my insomnia poem. Generally, you'll sleep through it, but on occasions of anticipation, heartache, or too much caffeine, you may find yourself lying awake at 3.25 a.m. and the world is silent. Perfectly still, longing for sleep, you may hear your heart beat, like the pendulum of a grandfather clock in the next room. Ear pressed against pillow, turned back in, listening to your own blood flow. It echoed the sound of the ocean in a seashell. Then, in the distance, tipping drops, hundreds of them, muffled mallets bouncing off skins like heavy rain on canvas, marching closer and closer, their rhythms resonating in the pit of your stomach, giving way to the metallic clack and clatter of steel wheel on rail, and then for an instant the sky is full of train sound and you're awake on this occasion of anticipation, heartache, or too much caffeine, and then the wheels surrender to the rain. And the rain bows to the timpanies. And the timpanies, they march away, leaving you with the sound of the ocean in a seashell. But generally, you'll sleep through it. <laughs> <laughs> than cigarettes and booze, so that's, that's what I'm at right now. And I even got to the point where like, I watch the bike races on TV. I started with the Tour de France, now I watch any bike race. And there's a, there's a, it's a really a team sport, much more than you would ever expect as being a team sport. And there's, there's these riders called domestiques, who are usually the biggest guy on the team that are used to drag the um, sprinter along throughout the whole race. So there's like one famous um, domestique named George Hingappi. He's never won a race in his life. Never been, been biking for 20 years, never won a race, but he's still considered one of the greatest bicyclists of all time. The domestique. Muscle fatigue is instigated, according to the latest scientific hypotheses, by tiny leaks of calcium on a cellular level stimulating enzymes to assault muscle fibers, endeavoring to shut down whatever business is afoot. But you already knew this. It is your nature to ignore this chemistry. Legs pumping with the precision of locomotive pistons, transferring energy to chains, sprocket, and wheels, cutting through space inside its salmon-like forward while every fiber below your neck screams for you to stop. Calves' sinews braided into knots, 
thighs threatening to split as if baking bread. The peloton follows in your wake, a brightly colored migration of spandex butterflies, and you come up out of your saddle and dance on your pedals as if thick spider bed were blowing a soul in your skull, and then it comes. The world is squeezed to a pinhole, and there is nothing but the sound of spinning wheels, the hum of ceramic ball bearings, your heartbeat muffled in your ears, your body separates from your mind, and for an instant, you are just a projectile sighting the finish line, and then it all explodes. Shouts from the crowd come back first, followed by an all-encompassing pain. Your will cannot maintain this pace. The universe is throwing a net over you, like Moses pointing to Canaan. You signal with your elbow the sprinter who has been riding your wheel for 126 kilometers, basking in your slipstream like a dandelion seed behind a semi-truck. And he slingshots by, and he stands on the podium to be kissed on both cheeks by two good-looking French girls. <laughs> While you, you look forward to Epsom salt and a whirlpool. <laughs> You want to hear Fidel Castro or Stingray? Fidel. Stingray. Stingray. Fidel. Yeah, two votes for Fidel. 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 Three. Three. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, one thing I've done is I'm sweating my nuts off up here. Um, uh, they don't roll off the stage. Yeah, I've uh, I've worked with kids a lot. And I took a bunch of kids to New York City for a Youth National Poetry Slam. Most of these kids had never been on a plane, never been out of Cleveland. It's all inner city kids. Um, Playhouse Square paid me like $1,500 to do it. And I thought, wow, what a great deal this is. I'm really pulling one over on them. And after four days in New York City with these four kids, I was like, I will never do that again. I wasn't even close to enough money. That was crazy. But uh, while we did this, um, there was a PBS film crew followed us, and they did a, they did a documentary on, on it. And uh, I got to know the director really well, and he was a big jazz fan, as am I. So we were able to sneak away one night and headed to Birdland. And I just wanted to go to Birdland. I just it's, it's a very famous jazz club, and um, I didn't care who was going to be there. And it was this guy um, playing guitar, playing like flamenco guitar and he looked just like Fidel Castro. So this is called <laughs> Fidel Castro at Birdland. That's be my last one. <laughs> can, I, can, I get a, can I get a paper towel or a napkin or something? I really, I got, I got sweat in my eyes. It's hot up here. <laughs> trumpet-shaped, blue-flowered hakaranda tree. The machine head, ivory tip, peg, and gear assembly holding eight strings in tune was precision fabricated in Japan by a computer numerically controlled machine. And Fidel Castro, he's singing in Portuguese. <laughs> and he's laughing at his own lyrics. His left hand crab crawling up and down the frets, his right bouncing about the strings as if he were counting out the notes on an adding machine. His backup guitar and bass players, well, they nod and they crack jokes behind his back. And Fidel Castro, well, he's singing about love. 
and he sings about losing love, and he sings about finding another love, and he sings about the love he thought he lost, but was merely hibernating in places that he had failed to look until this very instant. <laughs> but now Castro spits a bit when he sings. <laughs> Dropless, backlit by blue stage light, reminiscent of a time-lapse film of a dogwood flower shooting pollen into the air. <laughs> All the while, the drummer accentuating the downbeat on a cowbell muted with duct tape. <laughs> and we sit at our manhole-sized tables, our exorbitantly priced drinks soaking <laughs> semicircles into white linen, and we listen to this Fidel Castro. This Fidel Castro, who in 1945, while he was a law student at the University of Havana, followed that black spike-heeled blonde wearing the blue sequin dress into the Tropicana Club, <clears throat> where he listened to Dizzy Gillespie, completely forgetting about his date with that redhead going to the Communist Party meeting. <laughs> <laughs> this Fidel Castro, for whom music is the revolution. Thank you, thank you. All right. One final round of applause for Mike and the rest of the poets today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic job. Excellent, excellent artist. I hope you guys come back next month. Um, okay, well that concludes uh, what we're doing here today, but I would like to open it up if anyone is interested in coming up and reading a poem, um, you know, we can take a one minute break, you can regroup and let me know, and uh, anyone thinking they may want to okay. Alright, well if you change your mind in the next few minutes, you can come up and you're more than welcome to go ahead and read a poem if you want. So, alright, thanks again to everyone, I appreciate it. Stick around uh, next month. We'll be doing the same thing again. Again, talk to them if you're interested in getting books. And uh, you can find more information on Facebook. Just type in Living Poetry of Karma Coffee. Thank you very much.